health is really inner peace. The frustrating thing is, is when we keep our eyes, our, our physical eyes on, on symptoms or conditions of the body and it's, it's almost like the mind is caught like in a, you know, almost like in a vortex or a time warp or an interpretation of looking, looking for change, you know, where there really can be no change or looking for um, some kind of si significant shift to occur into the form because the, the problem has been defined in the form it's been defined in the body and it was Einstein who said you know you can't solve a problem at the level of the problem you have to go beyond it beyond the level of the problem to find the solution and really that was pointing to to you you have to get to your mind find the, the escape hatch or the, the correction. Even in this world we seem to have shifts of mind and consciousness and then the, there's what we would call symptom removal. There seems to be a reflective experience of that shift. Although, you know, it can, it can shift back or it can shift in other ways, it doesn't seem to be a constancy with that until you go deep enough, you go far enough back in the mind. So, um, you know, there's questions in the back of the text, or, or actually back of the teacher's manual, how is healing accomplished? And um, one of the interesting questions to Jesus is, should healing be repeated? And he's really talking about, you know, the definitive nature of healing and that if, if the teacher of God still perceives Sees, you know, continuing symptoms, or still has concern for appearances. He need to, he needs to come back to the Holy Spirit and ask that his own mind be healed. You know that that it's implying again that the problem is misperception. The problem is distorted perception, or you could say the distorted miracle impulses. Those are all part of the problem, and the solution is not ever to be found in the form. And that's what all this mind training is about. It's really a course in, in bringing everything back to mind and actually having an experience that everything is mind, that there is no sickness apart from the mind, that all illness is mental illness. It takes a lot of convincing. I mean, it seems like the Holy Spirit's got one major convincing job when the mind is tricked itself into believing that there's physical ailments. You know, if somebody says, oh, they're ill, or they're not feeling well, they're sick. What's wrong with them? What's hurting them? You know, oh, they believe in separation. You know, <laughs> you know it's, that's the metaphysically correct answer, but, but as far as practical experience, it's like there's such an assumption. You know, what, what are the symptoms? Um, what is the diagnosis? Um, even, that's with, we'll talk about doctors and, and what seems to be physical illnesses and diseases. Um, but then you bring it back to, even back closer to the mind and you still find the same thing. That, that if you go to see a psychotherapist, you know, and, and Jesus talks about this in the psychotherapy pants, but that, that that the patient is going to the psychotherapist because he wants a magical he shift, he wants a better life and form. He wants the therapist to magically take away his, his problems, his difficulties, and give him a better life in form, a better earth life. You know, if, if the patient knew that he was going to psychotherapy to have his entire world dispelled, <laughs> or his entire self-concept dismantled, you know, he might think twice about going into therapy. Like, I didn't ask you to take my life away. I, I asked you to make a better, <laughs> give me a better life, which is more like give me a better illusion, instead of the dismantling. 
Now, of course, we have great movies for that too. I Heart Huckabees, where you have we have uh, Dustin Hoffman as a, a, an existential uh, therapist, Lily Tomlin, and and the patients that go to visit them are going in there to have their entire world uh, dismantled, their entire perception of of the world completely undone, and that's what makes it so fun. And and as soon as the patients, you know, start to work with them, they want to run <laughs> and get away. Like, oh no. And how much do you charge for this? You know? And are you guys legit? You know, it's like, it's all the questions you might get. You know, imagine going back to your parents and saying, oh, I went to psychotherapy today and and, uh, yeah, they were doing a good job of dispelling you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how was your therapy session? Yeah, I'm feeling really good. <laughs> and you're looking pretty non-existent. <laughs> you know, it's, like, you know it's, it's pretty sharp when you start to, to see that. But that's actually, it's, you see it's a much deeper context uh, for talking about symptoms or sicknesses and illnesses. And, and really that's, that's what we're in for. When we go for healing, we're in for this deep journey into letting go of, of everything we think we think and think we know. You know, um, Jesus tells us that healing occurs the instant that the patient no longer sees any value in sickness. And on the surface it can be like, what does that even mean? I'm healed when I see no more value in sickness. Like that's implying that I'm attracted to sickness. You know, and people do say to me, who in their right mind would choose to be sick? And I say, that's it, you got it. Who in their right mind would choose to be sick? No one in their right mind would choose to be sick. But there must be a sick attraction to wrong-mindedness. A sick attraction to pain, a sick attraction to guilt, like an addiction to misery. And if you listen to people who've gone through 12 steps, they'll say, yeah, it's, it's a really sick attraction to addiction. Like there's something weirdly attractive about it. And really, the deeper you go in just following the teachings of the Course, it just starts to expose that. It starts to say, you know, you're, you're choosing for this, you're deciding for this, it's a bad habit, it's a bad thinking habit, it's a bad belief habit, but you can change your habit. Whatever was made can be unmade. Whatever you thought you did can be undone. You know, it's, it's whatever, no matter how bad you think it got, it's reversible. Because, you know, you can't accept a correction for it. You just have to quit hiding it. So, I know for myself, when I had physical, what seemed to be physical symptoms, um, and I was working with the Course, you know, it was perfectly timed that I would have seemingly physical symptoms and I would be less than, on less than 136. Sickness is a defense against the truth. It's all orchestrated, it's all coordinated to bring about the sense of really having to face it you know, go inside and face it. And, and it was very powerful for me because the more I was able to really face it and expose it, the more I was able to shift, have a shift in mind and have a complete different experience. It was like, it wasn't like this nagging sense of symptoms hanging on or going away a little and then coming back strong or they fade and they're back and so on and so forth. It was this instantaneous sense of, of freedom and release, which really gave me a sense that it was just a decision in mind. You know, because it was just, it just, just vanished in an instant. Very, very powerful, very, very convincing, you know, very much had me say, I like that. I want more of that. Because it was so out of pattern, instead of, seemingly hanging on with symptoms or battling, almost like battling against them. It was like, no, take me back, take me way back in my mind to the point where I can choose again.
you know, really choose again. So to me, that's that's what all this is about, and that's that's why that those kind of experiences just spurred me on, you know, to to practice even more, you know, to make less exceptions with the lessons, you know, to really give it up, give it my all. So that's the direction of the solution. Medicine, doctors, and, and a whole bunch of other things in that category would, would be what the Course calls magic. And the reason, talk about being addictive, you know, it, it's, it's turned to so often because it seems to work. Uh, whether it's like Gandhi using herbs, or whether it's what we would define as medicine, medical things, things being used for medicinal purposes and so forth. Um, that's the tricky thing about magic is it seems to work. Jesus describes it in the Course as like a spell. He's like using like something out of a nursery rhyme. It's like a spell that seems to work. And so you go to it again and again and again. Although people do have experiences sometimes as they advance spiritually and they start to see things more as decisions in mind, that some of the things that seem to work before don't work again. So it's, it starts to be like, hmm. It starts to break the spell a little bit. Uh, or like in the Truman Show, you know, at the beginning of the Truman Show, he's, he's just outside and all of a sudden this serious light, like this theater light, falls and crashes to earth and lands in the middle of the road. And he goes out and he bends down and he touches it. He doesn't know what it is. And then he looks at it and then he starts looking up. And then right away the next day, the next time he's in the car, they start to explain the phenomenon. A plane was shedding parts or something, you know, always to explain it away as if it was really a clue that this was a stage, it was a setup, a, a, a theater light. <laughs> dropping right down onto a street, you know, from the sky. It was a, it was a hint. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens as we, as we go through the spiritual journey. We start to get more and more clues and hints that things aren't the way they seem to be. And particularly with, with medicine, um, you know, and some of, some of us will read studies about placebos and the, and the power of the mind and the power of faith and belief and so on and so forth and how many doctors are using them and prescribing them and so forth and receiving achieving these results so it's like all that's doing is it's breaking it away from the drugs having a causative effect on the body and pointing back to the, the mind the power of the mind um, I mean I, I always use lots of examples I mean with physical ailments, I think one of the most striking things that I ever saw as evidence of the power of the mind was, you know, watching like a, sh a movie like Sybil and multiple personality disorder. And then you start reading some of these case studies of multiple personality disorder. One personality has cancer or heart disease or, you know, diabetes or something like this then it shifts into another personality, it's gone. The diabetes is gone, the cancer is gone, just like, whoa, you know, and then if it's, it's like four or five, six, seven personalities, not only do all the personality characteristics change, the mental characteristics, but the physical characteristics, and oftentimes the physical attributes shift. It's just as, as if you were completely just shifting characters from different lifetimes and that they would go from one lifetime, so-called lifetime, to another like this. You know, those, those are like striking evidence of the power of the mind. And, and those are also beautiful witnesses to start to point you inward to everything is, is mental and everything is a decision. So, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with medicine and there's nothing wrong with magic, you know, a lot of it is, is very helpful in, in reducing fear. Uh, that's 
a helpful aspect of it. But you should know that this, with reducing the fear that all ego defense mechanisms were designed to minimize fear without letting it go. And that's the key part, without letting it go. That's why the mind hangs on to the defenses. They seem to have some value. They do minimize the fear. There's obviously certain medications, when you take them, there seems to be a pretty significant change of reduction of pain or more ease of movement, for example, with arthritis or, or some kind of benefit and effect that is directly experienced seemingly through the body. And then the mind's like, I'm going to go back to that one again. <laughs> if this ever comes on again, I'm going to make sure I, I handle it with the medicine. And then it becomes a, a unquestioned just pattern, whereas the Course is like saying, no, you, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not evil. It's not bad. It's just, as you keep coming inward, oh, I, I can shift mentally. I can call upon the miracle, you know, that that taketh away all symptoms and diseases of the world, you know, which is really the whole point, is to have a lasting healing. Like when you read a lot of accounts, for example, in the tradition of what we would call a Christian science, there, there are actually those kind of accounts. Um, bones that are healed within, uh, that are broken or fractured within a matter of seconds or minutes, um, which you know, doesn't seem like that they're a lot of part of medical history, but but there are accounts of those kind of things. Um, in Christian science, it, it's beyond kind of sometimes healing, uh, like fractures and so forth, to the times when a, a limb uh, has been severed or, or it seems like uh, disease or cancer has eaten through the skin and past the blood vessels and down you know, into the bones, what we would say, pretty far gone in terms of medical conditions, and entire tissue structure, bones, you know, flesh, uh, blood vessels and everything have been like regenerated, almost as if the body is like a hologram, and it is. <laughs> Almost as if the body is like a science fiction movie where it's like like an, an image. Um, some of you might have seen that movie. What was the movie that we saw a while back with uh, Jeff Bridges? It's about the, the game. Tron. Tron. Uh, there's that character in Tron, the, the woman who uh, is there and, and and they're on, they're kind of toward the end of the journey and everything, and, and I think she has something that's cut off or severed or something like that. And, and it's one of those regeneration scenes, like, you know, years, decades ago they talked about, with even with Christian Science, here it is in a science fiction movie, and this healing power comes in and, and it's like regenerating something that was damaged, you know, seemingly beyond repair or damaged, cut off, and so on and so forth. And and once you start to understand kind of the Im imaginary, holographic kind of nature of these things, um, it does get into time even, because, because when the mind is untrained, the, the physical form and the, the image seems, seems quite stationary and solid even. And then that, you know, you start to investigate and explore that. You go a little bit more, you get into quantum physics, and you, you realize that, that there's a whole difference between what we would call Newtonian physics, which is based on the perceivable, observable, seemingly factual uh, world of form, and it's, it's inferred, it's de deduced from that. And then once you get into quantum, you, it's like, you're in a whole different realm of, of properties and the way things work. And what seems to be in Newtonian waves, you get into particles and you find out that nothing, not some of the stuff that applied in Newtonian, but none of it applies 
in quantum. You know, when you go smaller, when you get beyond the gross perceptions of the world, you, then you get into probabilities, you get into um, potentiality. You get into this idea that an atom, which we thought was like a small building block of matter, you know, when we were growing up and we were reading in our science books, you know, small particles and cells and molecules and atoms, and then, you know, they talked about atoms as if they were, they were things, very small things, and then we're thinking in terms of things, and then all of a sudden when you get down into quantum, you know, and atoms are, are potentialities. Potentialities? What do you mean a potentiality? Is it there or not? Tell me. I want to know. Can you see it? Can you observe it? Well, it's, it's a potentiality. Uh, you know, Schrodinger's experiment, you know, you know, is the cat dead or alive? Well, it, it depends on the perceiver. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean it depends on the perceiver? Is the cat dead or alive? Those are two different outcomes. Well, it depends on the perceiver. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and then, you know, it's cool, because then you start to work it in and you start to realize the power of perception, you know. We all have experiences where, where, you know, four or five people witness something and they have different eyewitness accounts. But when you start to really explore perception more and more and more, you know, you start to take it in and in, and you start to realize that what Jesus is teaching in the Course is, is I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me, that if you really follow the teachings out, you can see why no two people see the same world. And, and if you take it even deeper than that, you can see why, ultimately, that there are no two people. I mean, it really, if you like, oh, look about a mind bender. It just, when you go deeper and deeper and deeper into quantum and, and how perception works, you start to to realize, you know, that's why they have funny people like Fred Allen Wolf with his wacky hair, you know, saying, try it out for yourself, you know, come on down the rabbit hole with me and, and, and witness this. You start to realize what Jesus is teaching in the Course, and what the quantum physicists are teaching, that, that there is no world apart from what you think. That, you know, it's beyond Descartes, I think, therefore I am. There's an I am presence that's there, but there's all these unreal thoughts that present this unreal world. And as long as you have any investment in those unreal thoughts, you will see a world of unreality and, and believe that it is absolutely solid and absolutely real. And it doesn't seem to be all energy. And it doesn't seem to be all connected. And it just doesn't seem to be what what it really is. It just seems to be something else, separated, fragmented, you know, conflictual. It, it just is a, it's a total distortion. So to me that's, that's very important to start to question the nature of the world that we see. And beyond that, question the consciousness of the mind that's dreaming it. You know, really take it in. That's where the freedom comes.